the idea behind Carbon Direct has always been to work with both clients, so work with companies or governments that need to decarbonize, uh, help them lower their carbon footprint, help them buy carbon removal, and also provide capital that the industry needs to grow climate and carbon solutions. And always consistent with that was whatever we do, we have to ground it in, in science. The carbon math, if you will, is unrelenting. And if you're not honest about the scientific need to get all of this right, you're not going to do any good in the end. Carbon capture, carbon offsets, carbon credits trading. These are all the buzzwords we hear a lot these days. But as America's big businesses work to lower their emissions and establish a path towards carbon neutrality, helping these companies innovate and optimize operations has become big business itself. Today, we talk with a founder of a company at the forefront of helping scale the negative emission industry. Before Jonathan Goldberg started Carbon Direct, he was on what many consider the other side of the energy trade. He founded and ran BBL, a commodity hedge fund, was a trader at Goldman Sachs, and a partner at Glencore. He now sits on the board of the Columbia Center for Global Energy Policy. It is this diversity of experience that Jonathan and Carbon Direct bring to their stakeholders as they help move towards a net neutral future. Jonathan, thanks so much for being here today. It's great to see you. I mean, did you always know that you wanted to go into finance? Is that always something that you saw on your path? No, definitely not. You know, I actually in school wrote a bit, various newspapers and the like, and I had a a job uh, both in high school and then actually an early part of college at, at Reuters, the news agency. I had no idea what they wanted me to do. They randomly put me into the commodities group covering oil and energy markets. I knew absolutely nothing about those things, but that didn't stop them from letting me publish a whole bunch of stories about you know, various energy markets, price changes, why I thought the the sort of geopolitical side of that was very interesting. I also found that it, it didn't pay terribly well. Uh, so <laughs> during school, applied for and, and started working at, at Goldman, but in the commodities group following that interest. So uh, no, it was not always obvious to me that I would do financial stuff, but did quite like the environment at Goldman when I started there. There's a I forget where I read. There's a description of you as, quote, an oil and gas trader who became a staunch advocate for decarbonization. I know you don't love that description. Um, tell us why. Tell us how. Wh- what's the better way to characterize y- your point of view in the world? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know about that, the characteristic in itself, but I, I think that there's a tendency to say, well, you know, trading oil and gas or doing energy related things bad, doing decarbonization things good. And I've, I sort of always found that too simple. Um, you know, traders, investors, you know, to some extent, it reflect preferences within the economy, within society, within policy. I, I don't think that that's inconsistent with trying to tilt stuff towards lower carbon or different types of of outcomes. I think it's too sort of easy to say, well, you're you're long oil, you're bad. If you're short oil, you're you're good. The world's a lot more complicated than that. You know, frankly, we're seeing that every day now, where the we're trying to balance two competing needs at the same time. One, there's an absolute climate imperative to lower CO2 emissions now and over time, and then ultimately remove legacy CO2 emissions at the same time. And with the economy, you know, real world people problems are severely challenged by high prices um, that are occurring now in Europe and here on gas and on oil. And um, both of these things are really big issues. And I think you need to be aware of how energy systems work if you want to have a coherent policy or a coherent investment framework for how to push forward low and ultimately negative carbon investing. I mean, it's a good segue to my next question, which is just thinking about the world we occupy and, and the competing interests and values and, and needs. You know, If the goal globally is net zero, what is it going to take from various parties to get there? Can, can we do it um, in a silo or, or do we need kind of everyone working together to some extent? Uh, most definitely everyone working together uh, to a large extent. You know, I think the thing that's both like exciting and also frustrating about net zero and ultimately again, you know, net negative emissions is I think technically 
we know how to do it. Some of the technologies haven't been deployed at scale, which the IEA makes clear. But I think as the sketch of what it will take to decarbonize, we, we sort of know the tools that are in the, the toolbox. The challenge is it's expensive. You know, the fossil energy is very good at certain things. It's very bad at emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, which has huge costs associated with it. So the transition is going to take a huge amount of money and investment. So that means you need financial players to put the capital up and you need a policy environment that's conducive to financial players putting up the, the money. You also need, you know, cooperation between countries, within countries, things like that. So it is definitely a, a all of the above and many, many people involved. I think people miss the scale of how big energy systems are. You know, we invest several trillion dollars per year in the sort of legacy energy industry. We move five gigatons per year of stuff every year. It's just so much bigger than anything else. So sometimes you hear, you know, is direct air capture or is hydrogen or is this thing or that thing a silver bullet? There are no silver bullets. It's it's going to take all of these things to decarbonize. I think that's a good opportunity to get into some of the basics. <laughs> a lot of this stuff it can be complicated for folks who aren't familiar. Let's start with just some basic terms. I know your job seems to be explaining complex topics to folks, so I suspect this will be a, an easy one for you. But uh, how would you describe what carbon management is? Yeah, so um, it's, it's sort of a loosely defined term. What I would say carbon management is, is sort of an understanding that the release of CO2 has a sort of physical impact in the atmosphere. Uh, it accumulates over time. And the management term comes from the need, the necessity really, to manage both on an ongoing basis. So by an ongoing basis, I mean lower uh, through reduction and capture technologies, the flow of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. So that's the, the 40 gigatons per year that the economy emits. Uh, but I would also include within the phrase management, the need to ultimately remove CO2 to balance residual emissions and to take care of the mess that we've already gotten ourselves into. So the CO2 you emit on an annual basis, it stays up there. And we've got to deal with that legacy CO2 in addition to lowering the amount that we emit every year. Awesome. I think the next one will be an easy segue. How about natural climate solutions? So natural climate solutions involve things like trees, soils, mangroves, naturally occurring ecosystems that need or can be managed in a way to change how to increase how they are either promoting biodiversity and or managing CO2 in a greater way. So nature-based solutions, you know, people tend to think of planting trees, letting those trees grow over time to suck up more CO2, or changing the harvest pattern Rather than cutting a tree down in 20 years, you cut it down in 30 years and the biomass increases. And with that biomass, you get more CO2 storage. So I think the kind of most thoughtful definition I've, I've heard of, of MBS is really um, ecosystem management. And that ecosystem management drives biodiversity and carbon goals. Awesome. And then the other side of, of carbon management that I know you guys think a lot about, um, how would you define or explain carbon capture to folks? You know, first, I would say that carbon capture, it's sometimes sort of broadly defined, but I put it into two buckets. So point source carbon capture or capturing CO2 from the point of a source of emission. So from a flue gas where you have very concentrated streams of CO2, you can capture that CO2 through machines, through technology, and then ultimately store that CO2 in the ground. So rather than emitting a ton of CO2, you're not emitting a ton of CO2 in simple terms. And the other side of carbon capture is carbon removal. And that's lowering the atmospheric stock of CO2 from the atmosphere. So, you know, there's four parts per million CO2 roughly in the, the atmosphere. You have to take that from the atmosphere. It's a more energy intensive process. It's more difficult uh, than point source carbon capture, but it's it's a way of addressing legacy CO2 emissions where point source does not. Awesome. Any other big terms or big things people get wrong about decarbonization kind of at a foundational level that you think are helpful going into hearing about what Carbon Direct does? Yeah, I'm not sure it's, it's as directly applicable to, to Carbon Direct as, as other firms, but I think you know there's a concept of sort of levelized cost of electricity or marginal abatement curves that are sort of useful frameworks that a lot of people use in um, 
uh, energy transition. So it goes something like, you know, the cost of wind is on this part of the x axis, and the cost of natural gas is on the other part of the x axis. And I think that that's oversimplifying. So people like to say, what are the cheapest ways to decarbonize? And I think what we need to realize is that it really depends where you are, what solutions are best for decarbonization. So some areas, wind, solar, et cetera, are incredibly conducive to lower carbon outcomes. Uh, it's very variable though, depending on the geography and the type of, the type of solution you're, you're talking about. So we, you know, we like to look at things in a, what we call levelized cost of carbon abatement framework. So for every ton of CO2 that you're removing or avoiding, at that particular location for that particular policy or investment, what are you spending in dollars per ton? So it's a slightly more nuanced way of viewing it. That's one thing we try to be rigorous on. Awesome. Super helpful. Okay. So with that background for folks, what is Carbon Direct? Give us a little bit of background on the company. The concept really came from, I I was investing in traditional energy, um, renewables, et cetera, but really across the commodity and energy space. I got very interested in the area of carbon management through some policy work I've been doing. There's an energy policy center at Columbia run by uh, someone called Jason Bordoff that does just incredible work across all different types of energy policy issues, including climate. And it was through that and through some other academic work that I got, I I had no idea you could actually physically manage CO2 (laughs) and got to know people like Julio Friedman, who's now our chief scientist, Dr. Jen Wilcox, who was working with us at Carbon Direct and is now in the administration at the Department of Energy, and just learned that there's this whole suite of technologies and this whole suite of natural and, and ecosystem approaches towards managing CO2. And as an energy person, I knew how big the energy system was, and I would read and um, understand the importance of transitioning, but also like thought the market was just vastly underestimating how difficult this was going to be to do, the amount of money, how slowly this takes. Like It takes a really, really, really long time to build a refinery or build a direct air capture machine. So was quite concerned from a, a climate perspective that we're way behind and we are way behind. And when I looked at Carbon Direct, some of this came from a trading background as well, where in trading, commodity trade, you're always thinking through what's the demand side and what's the supply side. It's not just investing. It's not just creating demand. It's a bit of both. You know, so the idea behind Carbon Direct, and this is what we're doing now, has always been to work with both clients, so work with companies or governments that need to decarbonize, uh, help them lower their carbon footprint, help them buy carbon removal, and also provide capital that the industry needs to grow climate and carbon solutions. So that, that's kind of the original genesis of the idea. And always consistent with that was whatever we do, we have to ground it in, in science. The carbon math, if you will, is unrelenting. And if you're not honest about the scientific need to get all of this right, you're not going to do any good in the end. I mean, for an entrepreneurial perspective, I know that the potential total addressable market here is vast. Give us a sense of the scale that's required to truly deal with or think about this entire decarbonization ecosystem. Like, how big are we talking? And from your perspective, how much does does it all matter? Uh, it matters quite a lot. Climate, it's not like a binary thing where, you know, at 1.5 degrees, everyone's happy. And at 1.6 degrees, everyone is perished. Every bit is very important. Higher the temperatures go, more you see extreme events, which unfortunately we're seeing right now in Europe, but in particular in places like India, where it's, I mean, it's simply too hot to do anything. There's huge human, environmental, and um economic damage is associated with every gradient of higher temperatures. So this, this matters. Um, this matters a lot in terms of like scale, both like in dollars and in just how big a challenge this is. I mean, a couple of figures, I guess, to throw around, you know, there's about 1.6 trillion tons of excess CO2 we've admitted since industrial ages. You know, the price of removing that CO2 at the upper end you know, right now is quite expensive. It's, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars, depending, but say we get it down to a hundred bucks, you know, you're, you're talking $160 trillion to, to deal with that, which is order magnitude two years of, of GDP. That is a lot um, to, to deal with that. And we don't even have the technology at scale to do that. 
Another way to look at it is if you look at the amount of carbon that we need to manage on a global basis to hit some of the IPCC goals in weight, because carbon is a gas that you can measure and weigh, it's something like nine times the mass of every person in the world. So like just conceptualize that. That's every year. So the amount of stuff that we need to move is really, really big. It's double what we move in the oil and gas industry on an annual basis. That's obviously a massive industry and it will cost lots of money on an annual basis. Now that cost also gives lots of chances for investment and for transition and for proactive things that we're, we're really excited about. But we shouldn't kid ourselves about the size of the, the challenge. It's quite yeah. large. I think the numbers do help, especially hearing it in terms of GDP. With the need comes opportunity for innovators on the investment side. Tell us why it's a good business to be, to be in the carbon space, um, to be thinking about working on helping companies work on solving these problems. You know, what's the kind of business case that, you, that has you most excited internally? I guess I bifurcate it between the investment work that we do at Carbon Direct Capital Management and the client-facing work that we do within Carbon Direct Inc. I think on the client-facing side, 80% of large companies have made some type of net zero commitment. You're also seeing the SEC and other government-type organizations begin the process of either regulating climate work and or mandating disclosure around what you're doing. So if you say you're going to be net zero, you've got to say how you're doing it. So... This is something that is being demanded of companies by their employees, by their shareholders, and it's going to happen. So the business imperative is that you want to be in business. This is an issue that your employees and your stakeholders take very, very seriously. And our role is to help. Um, You know, our role is to help companies do that and do it with a scientific perspective. So that's the main rationale, I think that rationale will evolve over time because I do expect the regulations to increase and change where this is going to go from you know, voluntary statements about sustainability to more of a regulated framework and people need help managing that. And that's, that's what we do. On the investment side, I'd sort of break it down into two things. One is in the utilization of CO2. So investing in companies that take carbon and turn it into stuff. So you can take CO2 and turn it into chemicals or into materials for the built universe or into carbon monoxide. And our firm is an active investor in that space. And we actually think there's about one to one and a half gigatons per year of addressable market. That's a huge amount of companies that can use CO2, produce a lower or zero carbon replacement for the more carbon intensive industry and do it at what we would call a zero or negative green premium. So the same price as the incumbent technology. That's a great business. You're winning on unit economics and you're providing your customers and the economy with lower carbon options. And we're investors in those companies and we're super excited about it. To be clear, that's not all of the economy. There's many parts of the economy where it's it's still expensive to do that transition. And there, you know, we're very commercially excited about things like point source carbon capture, which we discussed a bit before, and carbon removal. And the revenue mechanisms for those are regulatory regimes that pay you for uh, that capture. It's been free to emit carbon for all of history. But of course, free is not the right price. There's been huge externalities and the government is starting to account for those things. And also, you're seeing more uh, corporate action, You know, paying for things like direct air capture and the like. And that's creating the economic incentive. Give us a peek behind the curtain. What's the difference between managing the scientists you work with on the advisory side and the investors you work with on the fund side? It's one of the most fun things about the firm, actually, is the different types of backgrounds people have and trying to sort of cobble it all together with a, a shared mission, right? So we think you need both things, right? You know, we've seen clean tech investing go astray. And it's not just bad for the investors who lose money. It's just bad, right? If if people aren't able to smartly and commercially invest into the space as rigorous and disciplined investors, well, nobody's going to put up the hundreds of trillions of dollars that are needed to like do the, the transition. So we really like the fact that our our investment team has this strong growth equity background. What we do is we complement them, and we literally sit them side by side on deals with scientists with deep technical expertise. Now, ultimately, our investment team will make the investment decision because it's the deployment of capital. 
But we're only doing that after getting, you know, the leading advice on why these technologies work. And that's both on the the cost of the technology. But the other thing that's really important to get right, again, in the spirit of scaling carbon management, is you have to do the carbon work. So take direct air capture, right? When you're doing direct air capture, it takes energy to do that. You need to make sure you're counting the full life cycle carbon impact of what you're doing, not just the capture part, but the energy that goes into it. And that's one of the things that our, our scientists really bring to the table. Awesome. I mean, you really do sit at an incredible cross section. Obviously, in the capital markets world, ESG seems to be increasing in funds flow. It's, it seems to be a hot topic across financial media. You mentioned clean technology and the venture and growth equity space. That seems to be really, really hot. And you're kind of amidst both of those, whether it's working with new companies to meet their ESG goals and objectives or investing in technology on the the clean tech front. Can you talk about where those two worlds collide uh, a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, you know, the ESG thing is quite tricky for me because I I think like everyone else, I don't actually really know what it means. I I guess what I would say is like, we try to define it, I guess, somewhat simply, right? We we invest in companies that have more than 100 million tons and, and more likely a billion tons of potential carbon impact from what they do that we can underwrite with particular financial thresholds, right? So we, we try to just define more clearly what we're trying to do. I, I think that's very helpful. I do think it's good that investors are starting to pressure companies to operate in more sustainable ways. We have very imperfect forms of government. There's no uniform carbon tax, for example. You know, we wouldn't need ESG if there were, you know, very clear governance, uh, social and climate criteria from different policy makers. Sure. When you think about some of the bigger companies you've worked with, how has it been working with those companies in the billion range that you talk about? How are they thinking about these challenges and solutions? Yeah, I don't know that there's one answer, right? I mean, we work with a number of large tech companies that over the last five years, obviously, have done very well for share prices and, and margins and the like. As a general rule, they take their role very seriously. Their employees are very committed to the sustainability. And I've been pretty impressed by a management's commitment to move the market forward. But it gets complicated, right? You know, not all industries have rich, robust margins. We do work with a number of airlines. You know, airlines are looking at sustainable aviation fuel to lower their carbon intensity. They currently buy offsets. Many of those offsets aren't very good. They're considering ways to buy offsets that are of higher quality. Those cost more. And it's difficult because consumers are very, very sensitive to price changes. We only support you know, companies buying high quality carbon credits. We define what those are. That's what we work with. And that's what we do. We, we don't sort of take a, a shortcut there. But I do think we have to understand this is why better, more coherent policy would be helpful. The constraints that different industries operate in and without the right framework, um, it's going to be very difficult for some of these industries to decarbonize at the rate that we need them to. Sure. I mean, that's an a interesting point. And you talked about regulatory regimes earlier. You talk about the need for clear, clean policy directives. Obviously, the global and domestic policymakers and governments have, to some extent, begun showing more support for some of these, for, for carbon capture technologies or natural climate solutions. I'm curious how you look at the world of policymaking globally, domestically. How do you think about that relative to your business? Yeah, um, I I guess first from an investing side, we are only investing based on current existing regulation and current existing policy. We think it's very risky to invest because you hope that policy will improve or you predict that a certain carbon tax or something will be put into place. I, I think that's... That's not a good recipe for success. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the IPCC report and or expectations around subsequent reports that we know will be coming in a few more months. Uh, There's a lot, obviously, in in, in the IPCC report. It was the first time that the IPCC really made it unambiguous that all pathways towards 1.5 or even 1.8 degrees require substantial amounts of carbon removal in them, we're sort of past the realm of might need to have and in the realm of we must have. And it's just a question of how much carbon removal is needed. So I thought that was quite helpful. The other thing that was very interesting in the report is, you know, it takes a long time to build all this stuff. 
So you don't just like wave a magic wand in 2040 or 2050 and say, voila, we're going to turn on the negative emissions machines. You need to start investing now. You need to start on the ecosystem management now. And I, I'm glad to see that so clearly laid out in the IPCC report. Now you've left me with two more questions based on your answer there. So one at a time. <laughs> um, the first, I think, is really important. You talk about the this is a long lead. There's a lot that's required over a long period of time. You know, we're really talking about intergenerational investments, intergenerational industries and sectors. What's your the framework you use to think intergenerationally about your work? Yeah, I, I think you can think intergenerationally about the climate challenge, but have more reasonable short-term growth equity consistent frameworks for investment decisions, right? So our fund, for example, you know, our investment criteria are we have a 10-year investment period, but we expect, frankly, shorter than that for realizations. Our companies are not going to solve all of the world's carbon problems, right? So what we're looking at is companies that, again, can scale to that significant carbon management threshold of 100 million tons or more and do so in a manner consistent with our financial underwriting. I kind of view it as we're putting our stakes in the ground on the technology suite that will scale. You know, the companies are licensing their technology. So it's enabling, you know, larger scale carbon management. You know, and then on the client side, you have to match those long term ambitions with short term tactical goals. Sure. That makes a ton of sense. I mean, the second question that I was thinking of listening to you talk about the IPCC was for some, for many, it read a little bit dark <laughs> or scary. How do we defeat defeatism? I really worry that, you know, people are like too depressed. I, I don't want to minimize the severity of the, the climate challenge, but you, you read a lot of, you know, never going to have kids and I'm never going to do this. And we're all doomed. And um, I, I just don't think that's helpful. <laughs> There's a huge range of things that people can do from one, be active in policy voting, for example. I don't know what it gets you to be overly gloomy about uh, these things. I, I think that a better approach would be, yeah, this is a really big deal. Let's look at all of these potential solutions that we have and the actual tactical steps that we need to scale them. And let's work on something there. Yep. One good example probably is, I just saw your announcement of a partnership with Scope3. If you could explain for folks what it means to decarbonize an entire industry, in this case, the ad industry is going to get decarbonized. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's a, I've, I've known Brian, the, the CEO of, of Scope3 for some time. And to be honest, I was shocked by the carbon intensity of you know advertising, but the, the data intensity of all the different impressions that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is quite remarkable. And you kind of learn this about every different industry, you know, advertising is one, but then you look at clothing and, and just it's, it's sometimes remarkable, just all of the stuff that goes into <laughs> creating it. So Scope 3 does a, a, a fantastic job on monitoring, accounting and helping to decarbonize a large amount of the advertising industry. What we partner with them on is our team has a unique scientific perspective on enabling our partners to purchase high quality carbon removal against those residual emissions, right? So the stuff that can't be decarbonized, we look for partners like Scope 3 to help, right? Essentially find all of the different ad agencies that have these net zero commitments, and we can work with them to do the carbon credit purchasing. We're really excited about it. Awesome. Well, there's good reason to, to feel the way you feel when you hear things like the IPC report. It's important to recognize that there's been such progress made and, and people are trying and we've got to focus on positive news and solutions and keep working that way. Yeah, there's like so much stuff to do um, that there's a lot of ways to tie the different parts of the ecosystem together. I think the Scope 3 Carbon Direct Partnership is a really good example of that. What's the one thing you want to make sure gets out there clear for folks who are listening? I, I think like most interviews try to Buck, you know, interviews and frankly, venture capitalists always try to bucket things into different groups, right? So this company is a software company, right? Or this company is a consulting company. And, and I think for us, Carbon Direct Inc., our client business, you know, it's about doing things in a scientific manner to help scale carbon management. Awesome. As you think about what you've done, what you've built, what stands out to you? Yeah, I, um, what we will be proud of in the future is like more companies that we've invested in 
that are managing CO2 in tough industries, you know, like cement, like our carbon capture companies or chemicals. Like, I think that will be very, you know, we are very excited about these, you know, hard to decarbonize, sometimes under discussed industries that like matter in a big way. This is unfortunately a very big growth industry where like you'll never run out of stuff to literally never run out. I, I think we'll be proud if we keep that commitment to having excellence in each of the different scientific verticals and execute uh, continuously. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate all the time and effort. Well, thank you again so much, Jonathan. I'm really excited for this one. Uh, thank, thank you guys. Thanks for, thanks for doing the podcast. Thank you to Jonathan Goldberg for this interesting conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gon. The episode is produced by our very own Will Gatchel and Chandler Bromstead. Executive produced by me with editing from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director, Kate Tucker. See you next week and don't forget to rate us and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform.